page 226. A picture of the Prophet Joseph Smith in the Sacred Grove with the following caption. That morning in the Grove in New York, when the Father and the Son came to Joseph Smith, was perhaps the greatest revelation ever given to the world. Page 227. Chapter 21. The Prophet Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was an instrument in the Lord's hands in restoring all that had been lost during the centuries of spiritual darkness. From the life of Spencer W. Kimball. During the 1970s, President Spencer W. Kimball traveled with other church leaders all over the world to meet with members in area conferences. At one of these conferences, he expressed gratitude for the legacy of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Because a boy 14 years old went out in the woods to pray in New York, all of these hundreds of thousands of people come to area conferences because the 14-year-old boy went out in the woods to pray, having read in the Scriptures, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. James chapter 1, verse 5. Because he did live the revelations from on high, we have the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have all of the blessings that can make us the happiest people in the whole world because a boy of 14 went out into the woods to pray. I am grateful that Joseph found his way into the woods, and I am grateful that he knew what he was doing and that he was serious-minded enough that he could take the word of the Lord as it came to him and enlarged upon it and built this kingdom. On another occasion... President Kimball described feelings he had when viewing a portrait of the Prophet Joseph Smith found in a room of the Salt Lake Temple. I look over on the front wall, and there is Joseph Smith, and I think what a great, great Prophet Joseph Smith was. He was no common man. I think of all of his persecutions and the suffering that he went through. I think of all the revelations that came from heaven to him, which he gave to us and then I gain new strength again. Page 228. Teachings of Spencer W. Kimball. Joseph Smith was called as a prophet according to the foreknowledge and wisdom of God. Joseph Smith was prepared for centuries before he was born. He was even named Joseph before he was ever born. See 2 Nephi chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. His mission was to come to the earth at the proper time in these last days, to open the doors to the great world, to give the gospel to them, to give the priesthood to them, and to give hope to them as they look forward to eternal life. Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Lord, was set apart, called before he was born, called long ages ago, to come forth at this time and to open the world to the preaching of the true and living gospel. Joseph Smith came into this world that was crying for help. For hundreds of years it had been helpless. It had been hundreds and hundreds of years since there had been a prophet. And so it was time. Surely God our Father and His Son Jesus Christ, who appeared to an Aaronic priesthood-age youth, Joseph Smith, to give that lad instructions for all mankind, did not simply make a random appearance to a person on this planet. Rather, the Lord says that this appearance, which was precisely planned, occurred because I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments. Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verse 17. God does nothing by chance, but always by design as a loving father. Joseph Smith's first vision opened a new dispensation of divine revelation. Under special need, at special times, under proper circumstances, God reveals Himself to men who are prepared for such manifestations. And since God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the heavens cannot be closed except as men lock them against themselves with disbelief. Page 229 in our own dispensation came such a grand experience. The need was imperative. An apostasy had covered the earth and gross darkness the people, and the minds of men were clouded and light had been obscured in darkness. See Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2. The time had come. Religious liberty would protect the seed until it could germinate and grow. 
and the individual was prepared in the person of a youth, clean and open-minded, who had such implicit faith in the response of God that the heavens could not remain as iron and the earth as brass as they had been for many centuries. See Leviticus chapter 26, verse 19. This budding prophet had no preconceived false notions and beliefs. He was not steeped in the traditions and legends and superstitions and fables of the centuries. He had nothing to unlearn. He prayed for knowledge and direction. The powers of darkness preceded the light. When he knelt in solitude in the silent forest, his earnest prayer brought on a battle royal that threatened his destruction. For centuries, Lucifer, with unlimited dominion, had fettered men's minds and could ill afford to lose his satanic hold. This threatened his unlimited dominion. Let Joseph Smith tell his own story. I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me to bind my tongue. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me, for a time, as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. At the very moment when I was ready to abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun. I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Joseph Smith History, chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. Page 230. The heavens which had been closed in large measure for many centuries were now opened. The voices that had been still and subdued and unheard through many centuries now began to speak. The revelation that had been well-nigh obliterated and reasoned out of existence was again available. A new truth, a concept not understood by the myriads of people on the earth, burst forth and in that moment there was only one man on the face of the whole earth who knew with absolute assurance that God was a personal being, that the Father and Son were separate individuals with glorified bodies of flesh and bones, and that He had been created in their image. As the Son was in the image of His Father, the Father God was the same kind of image as the Son. Nothing short of this total vision to Joseph could have served the purpose to clear away the mists of centuries. Merely an impression, a hidden voice, a dream, could not have dispelled the old vagaries and misconceptions. This young boy was entrusted with the greatest block of knowledge known to men. Remember, that spring morning not one of all the people in the world had absolute knowledge of God. There were many good people, but they had all walked in spiritual darkness these many centuries. But here was a boy who knew. Joseph knew, as no other soul living, these absolutes. He knew that God lives, that He is a glorified person with flesh and bones and personality, like us or we like Him, in His image. He knew that the long-heralded trinity of three gods in one was a myth, a deception. He knew that the Father and the Son were two distinct beings with form, voices, and personalities. He knew that the gospel was not on the earth, for by the deities he had learned it, and the true church was absent from the earth, for the God of heaven and earth had so informed him. That morning in the grove in New York, when the Father and Son came to him, was perhaps the greatest revelation ever given to the world. On the top of this page, we have a picture of the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood to Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith under the hands of John the Baptist. As part of the restoration, the prophet Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery received the Aaronic priesthood from the resurrected John the Baptist. Joseph Smith was the Lord's instrument in restoring the gospel. The young prophet was advised that he would be an instrument in the hands of the Lord in restoring the eternal gospel with all that was lost in early centuries. 
Then these visions and revelations continued on through years in which the voice of Jehovah was heard again and again, restoring to the earth through this young prophet the truths of the gospel, the priesthood of God, the apostleship, the authorities and powers, the organization of the church, so that again the revelations and the everlasting truths are upon the earth and available to all men who will accept them. The prophet Moroni appeared unto Joseph and spent long hours explaining the peopling of the American continents by the Lehites and also the Book of Mormon, which would be unearthed and translated. This record, the Book of Mormon, would help to establish the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Page 232. Through the gift and power of God, Joseph translated that record, now known as the Book of Mormon. The gospel was revealed, line upon line and precept upon precept, and truths were restored and power was given and authority was revealed, and gradually enough light and enough people were there for the organization of this kingdom of God, which Daniel saw two and a half millennia ago. See Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. After long centuries of spiritual darkness, the light began to shine when Revelation opened up this dispensation. The prophet Joseph Smith received the revelations from the Lord, bringing back to the earth that which was lost, the priesthood of God, the authority, the power, the right to administer ordinances, and the continuation of the revelations of the Lord to his people here on the earth. The power was given to Joseph Smith, whereby he could seal on earth, and it would be sealed in heaven. Those keys have been handed down from president to president. Joseph Smith sealed his testimony with his blood. The details of the life of Joseph Smith are familiar to us. He announced at once his glorious vision of the Father and the Son, and was immediately oppressed and persecuted. Modern scribes and Pharisees have published libelous books and articles by the hundreds, imprisoned him, tarred and feathered him, shot at him, and done everything in their power to destroy him. In spite of their every effort to take his life, he survived through more than a score of years of bitter and violent persecution to fill his mission until his hour should come. Twenty-four years of hell he suffered, but also twenty-four years of ecstasy he enjoyed in converse with God and other immortals. His mission was accomplished. Heaven and earth were linked again. The church was organized. Brigham Young and other great leaders were trained to carry on, and he had conferred upon the heads of the twelve every key and power belonging to the apostleship which he himself held. And he had said to them, I have laid the foundations, and you must build thereon. For upon your shoulders the kingdom rests. Page 233. At the top of this page, we have statues of the prophet Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram Smith with the following caption. The martyrdom of Joseph Smith, who was killed with his brother Hiram in 1844, is another of the infallible proofs of the divinity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his hour had come to seal with his blood his testimony, so often borne to multitudes of friends and foes. Though he hoped and prayed that the cup could pass, he knew it was inevitable. He said, I am going like a lamb to the slaughter. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 135, verse 4. And a slaughter it was. The shots rang out and freely flowed the blood of martyrs, for Hiram, his older brother, had chosen to remain with him. This precious blood soaked into the earth, sealing an undying and unanswerable testimony, which continued to ring in minds and hearts. Jesus sealed his testimony with his blood. Stephen did. Joseph Smith has now sealed his testimony with blood and died as a young man, to say unto all the world that the plates from which the Book of Mormon came forth were found on a hill near Palmyra in the state of New York. And thus, through understanding of this book and the Holy Bible, the gospel of Jesus Christ through administration of his angels was again restored to the earth. Page 234. 
Joseph was protected and his life saved in every instance of persecution until his work was finished, and he had done his part in the restoration of the gospel and the priesthood and all other keys of the dispensation, and until the organization of the kingdom was effected. He could not be killed before that time, though all hell raged against him. He wanted to live. Life was sweet to him. It held promise of sweet associations with his family, his brethren, and the satisfaction of seeing the work blossom into a full-blown flower. But his work was done. Other strong leaders could now carry on. He was needed in other fields. Only in his thirties, a very young man, he died and commenced his work in other realms. Mormonism will fail if we kill their prophet, they said. And they murdered Joseph Smith in cold blood. Undoubtedly, their fiendish grins of satisfaction at such a foul deed changed to perturbed grimaces when they came to realize that they had been but kicking against sharp points, injuring only themselves. Mormonism was not destroyed by the cruel martyrdom, but here was its vitality. The bullet-torn flesh fertilized the soil, the blood they shed moistened the seed, and the spirits they sent heavenward will testify against them throughout eternities. The cause persists and grows. Joseph Smith's work was not lost. His testimony goes steadily forward on to infinity. Today, a great people hailed for their education, practicality, and virtue stand to bear witness that the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, like that of the martyrs before him, is another of the infallible proofs of the divinity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, restored in its fullness through that humble prophet. Suggestions for Study and Teaching Consider these ideas as you study the chapter or as you prepare to teach. For additional help, see pages Roman numeral 5 through 9. What do you think are some of the greatest things the Lord revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith? For some examples, see pages 228 through 32. When someone who is not a member of the church asks you about Joseph Smith, what do you say? Page 235. What was God's role and what was Joseph Smith's role in opening the heavens for the restoration of the gospel? See pages 227, 228 through 230. In what ways was Joseph Smith prepared to receive revelation? What did Joseph Smith know after the first vision that he did not know before? For some examples, see pages 229 and 30. How do you think his feelings about God and himself changed? How have you been influenced by your testimony of the first vision? In what ways was Joseph Smith an instrument of the Lord in linking heaven and earth? See pages 231 and 32. What do you think it means to be an instrument in the hands of the Lord? President Kimball said that the mob hoped to destroy Mormonism by killing Joseph Smith. Page 234. What thoughts and feelings do you have as you consider what has happened in the church since the death of Joseph Smith? Related Scriptures Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11-14 through 14, Doctrine and Covenants section 135 and Doctrine and Covenants section 136, verses 37-39 through 39. End of chapter 21 of Teachings of the Presidents of the Church Spencer W. Kimball, The Prophet Joseph Smith Spencer W. Kimball, chapter 21, Scriptures Doctrine and Covenants section 1, verse 17 Wherefore I, the Lord, knowing the calamity which should come upon the inhabitants of the earth, called upon my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and spake unto him from heaven, and gave him commandments. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Joseph Smith History, chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. 15. After I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. 
I had scarcely done so, when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me, and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. 16. But exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me, and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world, who had such marvelous power as I had never before felt in any being. Just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. 17. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Daniel, chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for ever. 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11 through 14. 11. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. 12. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. 13. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. 14. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Doctrine and Covenants, section 135, verses 1 through 7. 1. To seal the testimony of this book and the Book of Mormon, we announce the martyrdom of Joseph Smith the prophet and Hiram Smith the patriarch. They were shot in Carthage jail on the 27th of June, 1844, about 5 o'clock p.m., by an armed mob, painted black, of from 150 to 200 persons. Hiram was shot first and fell calmly, exclaiming, I am a dead man. Joseph leaped from the window and was shot dead in the attempt, exclaiming, O Lord, my God! They were both shot after they were dead in a brutal manner, and both received four balls. 2. John Taylor and Willard Richards, two of the twelve, were the only persons in the room at the time. The former was wounded in a savage manner with four balls, but has since recovered. The latter, through the providence of God, escaped without even a hole in his robe. 3. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more save Jesus only for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. In the short space of twenty years he has brought forth the Book of Mormon, which he translated by the gift and power of God, and has been the means of publishing it on two continents, has sent the fullness of the everlasting gospel which it contained to the four quarters of the earth, has brought forth the revelations and commandments which compose this book of doctrine and covenants, 
and many other wise documents and instructions for the benefit of the children of men, gathered many thousands of the Latter-day Saints, founded a great city, and left a fame and name that cannot be slain. He lived great, and he died great in the eyes of God and his people, and like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood, and so has his brother Hiram. In life they were not divided, and in death they were not separated." 4. When Joseph went to Carthage to deliver himself up to the pretended requirements of the law, two or three days previous to his assassination, he said, I am going like a lamb to the slaughter, but I am calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards all men. I shall die innocent, and it shall yet be said of me, He was murdered in cold blood." The same morning after Hiram had made ready to go, shall it be said to the slaughter? Yes, for so it was. He read the following paragraph near the close of the twelfth chapter of Ether in the Book of Mormon and turned down the leaf upon it. 5. And it came to pass that I prayed unto the Lord that he would give unto the Gentiles grace that they might have charity. And it came to pass that the Lord said unto me, If they have not charity, it mattereth not unto thee. Thou hast been faithful, wherefore thy garments shall be made clean. And because thou hast seen thy weakness, thou shalt be made strong, even unto the setting down in the place which I have prepared in the mansions of my father. And now I bid farewell unto the Gentiles, yea, and also unto my brethren whom I love, until we shall meet before the judgment seat of Christ, where all men shall know that my garments are not spotted with your blood. The testators are now dead, and their testament is in force. 6. Hiram Smith was 44 years old in February 1844, and Joseph Smith was 38 in December 1843, and henceforward their names will be classed among the martyrs of religion, And the reader in every nation will be reminded that the Book of Mormon and this Book of Doctrine and Covenants of the Church cost the best blood of the 19th century to bring them forth for the salvation of a ruined world, and that if the fire can scathe a green tree for the glory of God, how easy it will burn up the dry trees to purify the vineyard of corruption. They lived for glory. They died for glory and glory is their eternal reward. From age to age shall their names go down to posterity as gems for the sanctified. 7. They were innocent of any crime, as they had often proved before, and were only confined in jail by the conspiracy of traitors and wicked men. And their innocent blood on the floor of the Carthage jail is a broad seal affixed to Mormonism, that cannot be rejected by any court on earth, and their innocent blood on the escutcheon of the state of Illinois with the broken faith of the state as pledged by the governor is a witness to the truth of the everlasting gospel that all the world cannot impeach, and their innocent blood on the banner of liberty and on the Magna Carta of the United States is an ambassador for the religion of Jesus Christ that will touch the hearts of honest men among all nations, and their innocent blood with the innocent blood of all the martyrs under the altar that John saw, will cry unto the Lord of hosts till he avenges that blood on the earth. Amen. Doctrine and Covenants, section 136, verses 37 through 39. 37. Therefore marvel not at these things, for ye are not yet pure, ye cannot yet bear my glory but ye shall behold it if ye are faithful in keeping all my words that I have given you from the days of Adam to Abraham, from Abraham to Moses, from Moses to Jesus and his apostles, and from Jesus and his apostles to Joseph Smith, whom I did call upon by mine angels, my ministering servants, and by mine own voice out of the heavens to bring forth my work. 38. Which foundation he did lay, and was faithful, and I took him to myself. 39. Many have marveled because of his death. 
but it was needful that he should seal his testimony with his blood, that he might be honored and the wicked might be condemned.'"